Hello and welcome to The Extra Point. I am Pat Boyle. 23 years ago, the man who wore that jersey number for a living shocked the world. After winning a third straight NBA title with the Bulls, Michael Jordan abruptly retired right before training camp was about to begin. How MJ's shocking news broke the night before is a fascinating story in itself. It happened right in the middle of a White Sox playoff game at the new Comiskey Park. Chuck Garfine recaps an unforgettable 24 hours. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Chicago. I think I got a phone call from someone because that was the that was the night uh, of the Sox game. I'm Greg Gumbel, along with Jim Cott. Is there anyone more symbolic of the winning attitude that the Windy City has adopted than Michael Jordan of the three-time defending NBA champion Chicago Bulls? But little did anybody know that in the middle of this White Sox playoff game, Michael Jordan was hiding an enormous secret that was about to shake the sports world right to its core. Let's uh, go quickly to Pat O'Brien. Pat? All right, Greg, a breaking story here. The Chicago Bulls have called a press conference for tomorrow morning, and there's high speculation and report that Michael Jordan will retire from basketball forever. When the news of his retirement broke, Jordan was still at the ballpark inside Jerry Reinsdorf's suite behind home plate. It was chaotic uh, because by the time he came up, it, it was out, it, had le you know, it leaked out. And I remember Jim Gray, for whatever he was working for at the time, tried to climb from the suite next to mine into mine, and I was afraid he was gonna fall down and kill himself. Jerry Reinsdorf said that he would not confirm the story. I said by not confirming it, Jerry, does that not lend credence? Jerry went on to say, well, maybe it does, but we won't have anything official to say until tomorrow morning. And then people were banging on the door trying to get in. So uh, we got security and we got Michael out of there. Back in Comiskey Park and at the end of the seventh inning, Michael Jordan making his exit from the ballpark. But the next day when we had the formal announcement at Berto, I mean, the place was jammed. Everybody was, everybody was there. We interrupt our regularly scheduled program for the Sports Channel Special Report. Most are in a state of shock right now because the potential announcement is that Michael Jordan, the world's greatest athlete, it's simple to say, and the best player ever to play the game of basketball, is about to announce his retirement from the Chicago Bulls. Man, I just can't believe it. When I lose uh, the sense of motivation and the sense of to prove something as a basketball player, uh, it's time for me to move away from the game of basketball. A lot of things were going on around that time about Michael, from the gambling to other things. So you really didn't, you didn't believe a lot of what you heard. It, be, it became real for us, and uh, it was pretty shocking. Is there any doubt in your mind that he will be back someday? I wish I could say yes, but uh, I don't think he's ever coming back. Michael and I had a. Not a bet, but a, a little, <laughs> he said, you'll cry today. Well, I haven't cried yet. Um, cried a little bit yesterday. Oh, <clears throat> he and I, I had a little bit of an emotional session yesterday. But uh, yeah, my emotions, uh, I cry anyway. The tipping point in Michael deciding to retire was the murder of his father, James, two months earlier. His dad always wanted Michael to play baseball. And that February, Jordan shocked the sports world again by signing a minor league contract with the White Sox. I guess the biggest positive thing that I can take out of uh, you know, my father not being here with me today is that he saw my last basketball game, and that means a lot. He was going to play baseball that summer. Uh, I don't think it ever got out, but, but, but uh, somewhere right after the end of the basketball season in 93, his father had not been killed yet. And that, you know, that changed everything. The death of his father just, um, I think, it was, it was the last gas. If you ride a roller coaster for nine years, don't you want to ride something else? And that's where I feel right now. I've been on this roller coaster for nine years. It's just time for me to ride something else. So to do this story, we needed the big principal characters in it. Unfortunately, we couldn't get Michael Jordan, but Jerry Reinsdorf was inducted into the Hall of Fame, so we knew we'd get Reinsdorf if we go to cover this event, which we did. And then, oh, Scotty Pippen would probably be at the Basketball Hall of Fame for his induction ceremony as well. So 
what I was hoping was go to Springfield, cover the event. I get Reinsdorf to talk about Jordan retiring. Pippen would be the, uh, the big bonus. So got there on Friday, spoke to Jerry Reinsdorf he, about Jordan retiring. Great. Didn't see Pippen. All day Saturday, no Pippen. And I was told that he was going to be at the ceremony. And before the ceremony, there was going to be this dinner for all the Bulls employees, the close friends as well of Jerry Reinsdorf. So we set our stuff down right in front of this, uh, the doors of this banquet hall in this hotel. And we're waiting for Pippin. And we're waiting for Pippin. And waiting and waiting. And there's no Pippin. And so this story I want to do on Michael retiring is it's basically all I got is Reinsdorf. I got a little bit of Paxson. I don't really have much here. I need Pippin. And then out of nowhere, off the elevator comes a man who's about six foot seven in a tuxedo and sunglasses, and it was Scotty Pippin. And now I'm thinking, well, hopefully he'll do it. He's running late. Is he actually going to want to sit down with me after he's been running late for this big dinner? And I said, Scotty, you got a few minutes? He goes, sure. So he sits down, and normally I would tell somebody who I'm going to interview, hey, can you take the sunglasses off? It's not a good look, but. I was just so thankful and relieved that I got Scotty Pippen. I let him wear the sunglasses and we got the interview. Thank you, Chuck. Vicki Santo is carrying on her late husband's legacy by continuing a cause he deemed more important than baseball. Before his death back in 2010, Ron said, it's funny, I always thought I'd make my biggest mark as a ball player, but it was after I started speaking up about diabetes that I really made a difference. And what Vicki Santo is doing is changing the lives of families all over the country, one dog at a time. Life with Ron was a total adventure, and it was fun. He was one of the funniest people I know, and um, we never knew where we were going or what we were doing, but we always had a good time when we went there. Santo was always happy and strong on the outside, but his body was in turmoil with type 1 diabetes, a disease he hid from his teammates because he didn't want to be seen as weak. If you live with a diabetic or you are a diabetic, it's all consuming because every single day is a different day. You never know when your sugars are going to drop or uh, go high, and so Ron, when he would leave the house, I would worry about him because I never knew it could be a life-threatening situation. After experiences with their own dog, Joker, Vicki realized that dogs could sense blood sugar levels, and her life-saving foundation launched a few years after Ron's death. Having that dog there is such a peace of mind. You don't have to worry. They're going to let you know, and dogs don't lie. That's the beauty of this thing. There's no mistakes. They tell the truth. And so for the parents of these children, you can never, they can't go to sleep at night and you don't worry about them. That's what inspired me to get this Diabetic Alert Dog uh, Foundation going. It's part of my DNA to help as many people as possible. And it came to Ron Santo and his family. It was something that I really felt uh, uh, the heart to do. The $18,000 dogs are funded by the foundation precisely paired with an owner. The unique training of each dog is the key to success. She'll take a t-shirt that is, has been soaked with the sweat of a diabetic when their sugars have changed. She freezes it, she tears it into strips, and she tucks it into their toys. And she hides it, and they have to find it. And that drive is what keeps them going once they're fully trained and delivered to their handlers. For the McKee family, their diabetic alert dog, Ray, has changed their lives. Their son, Sean, has had diabetes for almost seven years. There's a routine that you have to follow 24-7, and you can't ever break from that routine, not for a day. So that's, it's challenging to just raise kids and have, you know, fun and joy in your household and still keep that routine. I didn't know anything about it when he first got diagnosed, but the more you learn, the more confident you get. You know, the first time you drop them off somewhere and you leave them alone, that's pretty nerve-wracking. Sean can finally play football full-time with Ray by his side. Now that I can't play, I, I'm happy because it's really fun playing and I get to see all my friends. And one day at football practice, 
Ray alerted to Sean's high level. It was like windy that day, so my breath is going in the wind and just so happened to go right to him. So he started barking and jumping. When we tested my sugar, I was really high. I mean, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. You saved the day. Instead of one tool that we're using, we have two. And so we have this like ever present, you know, guy who has a pair of eyes and I guess a nose <laughs> on him. Um, and he's just so comforting. You know, he's just such a comforting presence. He makes his diabetes much easier and um, uh, he's um, uh, it's very fun to play with him and bring him everywhere. So that's, that's a good thing. Okay. As a parent, you wish you could just take on that burden and give them a break, and you can't ever. I think that's the hardest thing about it, is there is no break ever, not for them. And if I feel that way as the parent, I can only imagine for him what that feels like. I mean, he's taught me, <laughs> I want to know, he's taught me strength beyond anything I could have imagined in a kid his age. He's a tough kid. He has a great sense of humor about it. It's pretty amazing. This was a self-made foundation. This is something that, that she set out as a goal and something that she's been able to accomplish and something that she's been able to help. And it's, it's like anything else. You can help a thousand people or you can help one person, but if you can help one person, you're doing something powerful. Sean had the honor of throwing out the ceremonial first pitch this season at Wrigley Field as the Santo Foundation was recognized before the game. It was the first time ever that dogs were allowed on Wrigley Field. We absolutely wouldn't have a dog if it weren't for Vicki and Julie, for the donors. I mean, that's such an amazing, a lot of times you give money, maybe you don't know where it goes. I mean, this is what it's doing. It's literally a life-saving project and a life-saving dog, and we're, we're really grateful. I'm very happy she gave me a, a new friend new friend yeah and a new uh, she gave me i don't know how to put it. she made diabetes easier for me <sighs> i'm just in a little slice of the pie on the other side here to just say let's help the people that are living with this disease and it's not just the diabetic it's the mom the dad the school teacher Anybody who comes in contact with these kids has to be aware that they're diabetic because they might have to step up and help them at some time. The peace of mind that comes along with them is really wonderful. To learn more about the Ron and Vicki Sano Diabetic Alert Dog Foundation, go to ronsantofoundation.com. I think as an original content team, we always try to tell the stories right and we always make sure they're very personal. We also try to tell stories that people maybe don't know. Um, and with the Santo Foundation story, this was definitely um, a story that a lot of people didn't know and it touched a lot of people. And the reason we know that is because they ended up getting donations worth $28,000 um, to get two dogs to two families that really need it. And to me, that really touches my heart and it means that we did a great job telling the story. Welcome back to The Extra Point. The bond between Ben Zobras and his wife Juliana goes well beyond their marriage. Outside of the home, both are performers. Ben as the Cubs' versatile second baseman and outfielder, Juliana as a popular Christian rock star. Their careers have similarities that help them mentally prepare to perform on the big stage, which included a magical postseason run for Ben. It also helps with what matters most, the connection and love that they share with each other. Kelly Krull has that story. Zobris, high and deep, way back, gone! It's sort of like the American dream, like getting to do what you love when you don't necessarily have to, you know, you don't on a monetary scale, maybe you don't need to continue to play baseball. Um, 
but you love the game, you love what you do, I love to perform. People ask me that a lot, like, you don't have to be working, you're married to a professional baseball player, why would you keep working, you know, you're a mom. And I'm like, I never want to be the woman that's just living for the five o'clock glass of Pinot Noir. It's not gonna be me. We've experienced the game together and um, along the way, uh, you know, she was able to develop her music career and, and that door started to swing open. So it's been, it's been really fun to be able to both pursue our, our passions outside of um, each other, but with each other. We are always encouraging each other when things get hard, um, bringing each other back to why are we doing what we're doing? What's the reason behind this? How do you tackle what's lying ahead of you and continue moving on? They're very similar, baseball and music. We talk about the, the anxiety, we talk about the, the focus, the preparation, the hard work that it takes, and then um, really kind of finally having it all come together uh, at the moment that you really need to perform, being able to do that. And um, there's a certain mindset, a certain mental makeup that you have to have that uh, to be able to do it. And she's certainly got it, and um, you know I've got it, and we've been able to kind of swap notes and compare things at different times. While both Juliana and Ben are successful in their careers, the root of it all is the love they share, complementing each other perfectly in and out of the home. I call him still waters run deep. He is consistent through and through. He is like the black and white to my rainbow of color. She definitely has always been the artistic, creative, um, fun, exciting, uh, colorful personality in the family. You have to have that combination of two. At times I can be the the uh, um, party pooper or the you know the the black and white and and um, you know but I think sometimes the clarity that I bring to a situation um, you know helps helps us as a family make a decision. On the field I am so impressed with the way that he's always able to put aside his own stats and his his own glory, if you will, for the sake of the team. If the team wins, that's what he cares about. The pair have the unique experience of each having a fan base, albeit separate because of their different career paths. So social media is a great avenue to connect, though the Cubs second baseman wasn't exactly sold on the idea at first. I was always like forcefully against it for a long time, um, realizing kind of she needed to do it with music but I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to have any part of it. And um, you know, over the years, she's made me realize the value that, that there is in, in um, you know, reaching your fans in that way. This is real life. You know, this is what we do. This is our in and out. It's, it's very similar to everybody else's. Um, I love the opportunity to share my heart with fans. I'll run by things by her now. I'm like, should I say this or not? You know, and she'll give me her opinion. So th that kind of stuff is just, uh, it's vitally important, but um, you know, it's it's fun to be able to um, share some things with fans that you wouldn't normally get to share person to person. It's in a way a little bit of a gift back to them. Like, thank you for your support. Thank you for your love for our family and, and embracing an entire Zobris family and not just Ben Zobris, the player. On the field, the Cubs have embraced the target of World Series expectations all season. And in the Zobris household, they have too. Not shying away from the possibility of ending professional sports longest drought. We're not afraid of talking about it. Ben and I are very open about goals that we have and that was no doubt one reason that we signed with the Cubs why he wanted to play for this team was that elusive Cubs championship 108 years of pent up <laughs> whatever you would call it hoping for that to happen um, I just hope we survive it when it does happen <laughs> the stadium doesn't burn down <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> It's such a fun thought, but at the same time, it's a little scary. I mean, it's been a long time since that's happened. And, and uh, you know, this fan base is going to have, uh, you know, a heyday if that happens. So, you know, I think, um, you know, from her perspective, she knows her job is to take care of the kids. And, you know, I think the security is probably going to help, um, you know, certain things like that. But we're, we're just thinking, like, man, life already is, is pretty awesome. And this city 
the way they've, they've embraced us um, as a family. Uh, I can't imagine what it, what it would be like um, if we were able to bring a championship here, which is our ultimate goal. So if that happens, you know, I, I can imagine, um, you know, being around the city of Chicago, people are going to love us even more. From being around this Cubs team, what I find most unique is how close the wives and girlfriends are. I think fans see it too, whether you follow them on Instagram or in the players' walk-up songs. When the Cubs won the pennant and I was on the field talking to the families, it was really clear to me that their support for each other is a big part of the team's success. This story really shows that, and who better to show it than the Zobras, who are a power couple. Last winter, we had the pleasure of following Joe Madden around his hometown of Hazleton, Pennsylvania. He gave us an in-depth look of where he came from and the foundation for what his beliefs and morals are based on. What we found out, he's just like the guy next door. Here's a portion from Going Home with Joe Madden. You can see the apartment building I grew up in. That's uh, C. Madden and Sons Plumbing and Heating. That whole building right there, uh, down below was the plumbing shop. My original, where I grew up, was in that back right corner. Beanie still lives on the back left corner. My grandma lived in that house. My aunts lived in that house too, two different parts of the family. Everybody was right here. It was, uh, and my mom, come on, back up here. When my mom was a little girl, and that's several years ago, maybe we could block out the wind here. Beanie grew up in that white house right there. So Beanie grew up there, and she's lived here her whole life. This was C. Madden and Sons Plumbing and Heating. This is now uh, Jay and my sister Carmine have this consignment furniture shop here and one downtown. Uh, this used to be a plumbing uh, shop, and this actually was a laundromat at one time. I used to come down here and clean with my mom with the washers at night and you know clean up the dryers a little bit too. He always felt Joe was going to make it big somehow some way in MLB but I know getting to where he is now was not easy it was tough there's a lot of work a lot of sacrifice for his kids you know his grandkids they don't get to see him a lot we don't get to see him a lot anymore but when he comes home he's Joey he's not Joe he's Joey and we have a blast and there's my field Boom. That's the high school baseball field, but I, like I said, I see my dad's name when I see it, and that makes me. When they wanted to do it, I mean, now, of course, that's not that's not my thing, but I get it, I understand. So we're going towards um, our house here in town where Carmine lives now. Jay and I bought it three or two thousand three, two thousand and four, two thousand four. Uh, we're driving through Hazleton when we just started going out, and it's like a real nice, light, snowy, it's a wonderful light kind of a night. And we're driving around, and all of a sudden we see this for sale sign on this house, and it just became infatuated. And then we got inside there the next day or the day after, and one thing led to another, and we bought it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a Victorian, obviously, and it's... Uh, so the this smaller, is your home base when you come back? Yeah, and when, we talk, when she was talking about buying it originally, part of my motivated for a, because there was no real focal point for family anymore. Is that your stuff in there? I don't have it yet. Sarah's gonna get it for you. So funny story, we we're actually on our way back from the shoot, going to the hotel, and I realized that I lost my phone. and. So we went to a GPS, find your phone website, and we find it. It's just moving throughout Hazleton in several different locations. And finally, we you know, stop at one of the locations, a place we've never been, and we see Joe Madden's car. And I realized I left my phone in Joe's car. He was at his favorite restaurant. We didn't want to disturb him, so I got my phone from him the next day, but it's a pretty Funny story, me leaving my phone in Joe Madden's car. Well, that's a wrap on this edition of The Extra Point. To see more episodes, make sure you check out csnchicago.com. I'm Pat Boyle, and we'll see you next time.